Good evening, everyone. I assume by the, the stillness and the quietness right now that we haven't had our St. Patrick's Day libations and beverages. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Welcome to uh, the third installment of our year-long Eucharist lecture series. For those of us who are here with us in person, thank you for, for braving the weather tonight. But it, it looks like the storm will, will come um, about 40 minutes after we conclude for this evening so we can all get home safely. And for those of us who, uh, who are joining us via live stream, thank you for making the time to be with us. My name's uh, Jordan Haddad. I'm the director of lay ministry programs here at Notre Dame Seminary. As we gather here this evening, let us begin in prayer, invoking the intercession of St. Patrick, Apostle of Ireland. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us remember that we are in the holy presence of God. God, our Father, you sent St. Patrick to preach your glory to the people of Ireland. By the help of his prayers, may all Christians proclaim your love to all men. We ask that you grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Gregory Vall. Dr. Vall is a professor of sacred scripture and the chair of sacred scripture here at Notre Dame Seminary. He's been on faculty at the seminary for a total of 14 years, and he has previously taught at the Catholic University of America, which is my alma mater, so go Cardinals, Franciscan University of Steubenville, and Ave Maria University, where he served as the director of the PhD program and the chair of the theology department. Dr. Vall received a PhD in Semitic languages and literature from CUA in 1993. His areas of scholarship include biblical languages, the Old Testament, and fittingly, the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch. His book, Learning Christ, Ignatius of Antioch and the Mystery of Redemption was published by CUA Press in 2013. His second book, Scripture in the Mystery of Israel, Essays in Ecclesial Exegesis, is forthcoming with Franciscan University Press. He has published articles in a variety of different scholarly journals, um, which I, I won't list right now to save time. Dr. Vall is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, he and his wife, Lourdes, have four children, and together they reside in Covington. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vall to the podium for his presentation, The Eucharist and the Letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Good evening. This evening, we shall learn about the Holy Eucharist from one of the great theologians of the early church, St. Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius was born toward the middle of the first century AD, around the time that St. Paul was at the height of his missionary activity. Toward the end of that century, Ignatius became bishop of Antioch in Syria, a, great, a city of great importance in the early church. In the early second century, Ignatius was arrested as a leader of the Christians, taken in chains to Rome, and fed to the beasts at the Colosseum. Nearly everything we know about the life and teaching of Ignatius of Antioch comes from seven letters that he dictated on his way to Rome. 
a few weeks before his martyrdom. Most of these letters were addressed to local churches in Southwest Asia Minor, what is now Southwest Turkey. Ignatius was eager to provide these churches with solid teaching about two central realities of the Christian faith, the person and life of Jesus Christ and the nature of the church. In other words, the seven letters are concerned with Christology and ecclesiology. Christology is the branch of theology that answers the question, who is Jesus Christ? Ecclesiology deals with the question, what is the church? To properly understand Ignatius' teaching about the Eucharist, we must learn something about his Christology and ecclesiology. Providing accurate answers to the question, who is Jesus Christ, was a matter of great urgency for Ignatius. He had learned that heretical teachers had attempted to infiltrate the churches of Southwest Asia Minor with some success. One group of heretics denied the true humanity of Jesus. They taught that Jesus only seemed to be a man and therefore only seemed to suffer and die. This heresy is called docetism, from the Greek verb dokain, which means to seem. Ignatius responded to the docetic heresy with a strong reaffirmation of Christ's true humanity. Uh, so at this point, if you have a, a copy of the handout. Those who are here in person hopefully have a hard copy and those at home were sent a digital copy um, on their uh, via email. So we'll be reading these passages in order starting with Trallians 9. So this is the letter of Ignatius to the Trallians chapter 9. Be deaf, then, when anyone speaks to you without Jesus Christ, the one who came from the stock of David, the one who came from Mary. He, he who truly was born and both ate and drank, truly was persecuted under Pontius Pilate, truly was crucified and died while beings in heaven, on earth, and under the earth looked on, who also truly was raised from the dead, his father having raised him, whose father will in like manner raise us who believe in him, raise us in Christ Jesus, apart from whom we do not have the true life. You can see that Ignatius responded to the idea that Jesus only seemed to be man by using that word truly over and over again. Having studied the Gospels of Matthew and John and the epistles of Paul, Ignatius understood that our salvation depends on the true humanity of Jesus. Sanctifying grace, which Ignatius refers to as the true life, has come into the world through the actual events of Christ's human life among us. Because he conquered sin and death, we too can live forever with God. But this means that somehow we need to come into contact 
with the glorified humanity of Jesus Christ, with the sacred flesh and blood that suffered, died, and rose from the dead. This is exactly what happens in the Holy Eucharist. A second group of heretics taught that the followers of Jesus needed to practice Judaism in order to be saved. These misguided teachers insisted that the books of the Old Testament had more authority than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they required Christians to observe the Sabbath on Saturday, the seventh day of the week. These heretics regarded Jesus of Nazareth as a mere man, merely human, a teacher who was inferior to Moses and the prophets. And they did not appreciate the great importance of Jesus' passion and resurrection. This false doctrine is referred to as the Judaizing heresy because it required Christians to follow the practices of Judaism. Ignatius responded to this second heresy just as he had responded to the first with authentic teaching about Jesus Christ. Ignatius explained that Jesus is no mere man. He is the eternal word of God, the Logos. God had sent his word into the world in order to reveal himself personally and fully. While Ignatius has great respect for Moses and the prophets, he makes it clear that Jesus is far their superior. Jesus does not simply speak God's word. He is God's word. Though the prophets lived centuries before the incarnation, the grace by which they were inspired was none other, Ignatius says, than the grace of Jesus Christ. That is, it was a special grace by which the Holy Spirit was preparing the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah. Ignatius explains all of this and more in his letter to the Magnesians. So we turn now to our second text, Magnesians chapter 8. Do not be misled by heterodox views or old tales that are of no benefit. For if, even until now, we live according to Judaism, we confess that we have not received grace. For the godly prophets themselves lived according to Christ Jesus. That is why they too were persecuted being inspired by his grace. So that those who are disobedient might be fully convinced that there is one God who manifested himself through Jesus Christ, his son, who is his word, who came forth from silence, who in all things pleased the one who sent him. Ignatius of Antioch coined the term Christianity and placed it alongside the already existing term Judaism in order to indicate that the religion of the Christians was not simply Judaism 2.0. It was nothing less than a new life, a new grace that had come into the world through the passion and resurrection of Jesus. 
That's why Christians no longer observe the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. Instead, they live according to the Lord's day, as Ignatius puts it later in Magnesians. The Sabbath was the central observance of the Old Covenant, while the Lord's Day is the celebration of the New Covenant and the hope of the resurrection. Christianity has deep and permanent roots in Judaism, and Christians should study the inspired books of the Old Testament in order to understand God's plan for the world. But to continue to practice the rituals of the Mosaic Covenant, such as circumcision, Sabbath, and Passover, now that the Messiah had come into the world, this made no sense, Ignatius argued. To do so amounted to a public confession that one had not yet received the grace of the new covenant. Ignatius of Antioch considered the Sunday celebration of the Lord's Day and the offering of the Eucharist as the central event of the Christian life. So let's look at the next text, which is from his letter to the Philadelphians, chapter 4. Uh, these Philadelphians lived in ancient Philadelphia, which is now Al-Sahir, Turkey. As far as I know, they were not Eagles fans. Ignatius writes, earnestly strive to observe one Eucharist, for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup for unity in his blood and one altar, as there is one bishop, together with the body of presbyters and the deacons, my fellow servants, so that whatever you do, you may do according to God. There are four things to notice about this little passage. First of all, Notice the great emphasis it places on ecclesial unity, the uh, unity of the local church. Ignatius calls upon the local church to meet together for one Eucharist under the authority of their one bishop. Where the heretics had made inroads, they divided communities. In Philadelphia, Judaizing, the Judaizing heretics had convinced some members, perhaps many members, of the church to meet on Saturday to observe the Sabbath. And on that day of the week, they apparently held their own Eucharist without the permission of the bishop. While the rest of the community met on Sunday, with the bishop presiding over the Eucharist. Ignatius considered this rift within the Church of Philadelphia a disaster. After all, the Eucharist is the sacrament of unity, not of division. Second, notice that Ignatius does not view the Eucharist as merely symbolic. The Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus Christ, he writes. Ignatius is an early witness to the church's belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Third, Ignatius refers to the Eucharistic table as an altar. This indicates that the Eucharist is not only a communal meal, but also a sacrifice. But we must be careful to understand this correctly. In the new covenant, there is only one 
sacrifice. The Lord Jesus, who is both priest and victim, offered himself once and for all on the cross at a specific moment in history, probably in early April of AD 30. That sacrifice is not repeated in the Eucharist, rather it is represented. The one historical sacrifice of Jesus is made present sacramentally at every offering of the Eucharist. And fourth, with regard to Philadelphians 4, Ignatius is the earliest Christian author to give clear and explicit teaching about the leadership structure of the local church. Each local church, what we would call a diocese, is to have one bishop, a body of presbyters under the authority of the bishop, and deacons at the service of the church. This three-tiered hierarchy of bishop, presbyters, and deacons, together with the Eucharist and true apostolic doctrine, gives the local church its essential unity. Uh, Ignatius refers to the presbyters, and we still use that term but it's re referring to what we call priests. Just as the Judaizing heretics had caused a major rift within the church at Philadelphia, so the Docetic heretics had divided the church at Smyrna, where St. Polycarp was bishop. The Docetists, you'll recall, did not believe in the true flesh and blood humanity of Jesus Christ. They held that he only seemed to be human. This strange teaching reflects the fact that the Docetists did not appreciate the true dignity and goodness of the human body. As a result, they had a badly distorted view of Christianity. They saw the Christian religion as a purely spiritual matter in which the body played no significant role. That is why the Docetists were unconcerned with leading a morally virtuous life and unconcerned with performing corporal works of mercy. Not surprisingly, they also had a badly deficient understanding of the Eucharist. So we read about all of this in Smyrnians chapter 6, the next uh, text on the handout. So we're at the bottom of the first side of the handout now. Take note of those who hold heterodox views concerning the grace of Jesus Christ that has come to us, how contrary to the mindset of God they are. They have no concern for charity, not for the widow, not for the orphan, not for the oppressed, neither for him who is in bonds, nor for him who has been set free, neither for the hungry, nor for the thirsty. They absent themselves from the Eucharist and prayer, here referring to communal prayer, because they do not confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, the flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his kindness raised. Notice how the Docetus failure to see the created goodness of the human body negatively affected their way of looking at almost every aspect of the Christian life. 
Ignatius, by contrast, fully appreciated the importance of caring for disadvantaged members of the church and of society. And he saw this aspect of Christianity as you know, the corporal works of mercy as intimately connected to the church's sacramental and spiritual life. So he did not divide the spiritual and the material. Ignatius constantly reminds his readers that the human person is both flesh and spirit and that the Son of God became man in order to heal and unify the human person. Ignatius, Polycarp, and other early Christians publicly confessed that the Eucharist really is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. But the Docetists could not bring themselves to do this. Recall that when our Lord Jesus gave his teaching about the Eucharist at the synagogue in Capernaum, in John chapter 6, many of his own followers were scandalized by the non-symbolic way he spoke of it. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. That's John 6, verse 53. Afterwards, these disciples were heard to say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Eighty years later, the same teaching was a stumbling block for the Docetists. In Smyrnian 6, the passage we just read, Ignatius identifies the Eucharistic flesh of Christ with the historical flesh that suffered and died upon the cross and that was raised on the third day. This reference to the resurrection of the flesh of Jesus Christ is of great importance. We have already said that in the Eucharist, Christ's self-offering on the cross is represented, made present again. But the church has always taught that the Eucharist is an unbloody sacrifice. Jesus is not suffering on the altar or in the monstrance. During the 30-some years of his earthly life, our Lord's humanity was in a mortal state. That's how he could suffer and die. But when he rose from the dead and ascended to the Father's right hand, his humanity was glorified and thus was no longer subject to suffering and death. As St. Paul puts it, since Christ has been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. That's St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It is this victory over sin and death, and this glorification of the humanity of Christ that makes possible the sacramental life of the church, and above all, the Eucharist. As the epistle to the Hebrews teaches us, an epistle which St. Ignatius certainly read, when he was exalted to the Father's right hand, the Lord Jesus, who is our high priest, brought his self-offering with him into 
the heavenly sanctuary where he presents it to God the Father forever. So he offered himself on the cross, but then in the resurrection and ascension brings that offering into God's presence in heaven forever as our high priest. Because our Lord's sacrifice is now present in the glory of heaven, it can also be present sacramentally on all the altars of the church on earth. Let's turn now to Smyrnians 8. Now we're on the second side of the handout, where Ignatius focuses on the bishop's jurisdiction over the church's sacramental life. So this is uh, a very important passage of ecclesiology, the nature of the church. Ignatius writes, flee divisions as the beginning of evils. All of you follow the bishop as Jesus Christ followed the father and follow the body of presbyters as you would the apostles. And to the deacons show reverence as to the commandment of God. Let no one perform any of the actions that pertain to the church without the bishop. Let that Eucharist be considered valid that is held with the bishop presiding or with one whom he himself authorizes. Wherever the bishop appears, there let the multitude be. Just as wherever Christ Jesus is, there is the Catholic Church. It is not permissible either to baptize or to hold an agape meal apart from the bishop. But whatever he approves will be pleasing also to God so that everything that you do may be secure and valid. Already in the early second century, some of the local churches were becoming quite large. And it became difficult for the bishop to preside over every Eucharistic liturgy. For example, if he wished to travel, he wouldn't be present there for, the, for that Sunday. In such situations, the bishop could authorize one of his presbyters to preside in his place. In this way, the local church's life was still united under its one bishop. This is still the case today. Any priest, whether diocesan or religious, who wishes to say mass within the boundaries of a given diocese must obtain authorization from the local bishop. In passing, let me explain Ignatius's reference to the agape meal. This was a communal fellowship meal held in some early Christian communities. Apparently, the Eucharist was sometimes offered within the context of an agape meal. This led to abuses, even sacrilege, people stuffing themselves and getting drunk at the Eucharist. So the practice was soon discontinued. There's one sentence in Smyrnians 8 that is of great historical importance. It's the one that begins, wherever the bishop appears. Wherever the bishop appears, there let the multitude be, just as wherever Christ Jesus is, there is the Catholic Church. Here, Ignatius draws a parallel between the local church and the universal church. The phrase, the multitude, refers to the local church. And the phrase, 
the Catholic Church refers, of course, to the universal church. The Catholic Church is the true church throughout the world, but it also includes those members of the church who are in purgatory or already in heaven. We take the phrase Catholic Church for granted because we hear it almost every day. But it is not found in the New Testament or in the Didache, nor is it used by Clement of Rome. It appears here in Ignatius's letter to the Smyrnians for the first time in recorded history. The evidence strongly suggests that Ignatius himself coined this term after his stopover in Smyrna. In Smyrna, on his way to Rome, he had met with delegations from four local churches, including their bishops. This means that on that occasion, five bishops, at least five bishops, came together. Polycarp of Smyrna, Onesimus of Ephesus, Damas of Magnesia, Polybius of Tralus, and Ignatius of Antioch. They may even have been able to offer the Eucharist together. If you're wondering how they were able to do all this when Ignatius was chained to a detachment of Roman soldiers, apparently the Christians showed hospitality to the Roman soldiers, gave them a place to sleep and uh, a nice warm meal. And so they were able, the, Ignatius and his entourage were able to make prolonged stops at at least a few of the churches. This meeting of five bishops at Smyrna must have been quite an experience of Episcopal collegiality and of the church's Catholicity. Reflecting on this event a couple weeks later while writing to the local church where it had taken place, Ignatius used the term He Catholique Ecclesia, the Catholic Church. Next, we shall examine two short passages from Ignatius's letter to the Ephesians. The first of these is a well-crafted Christological statement. It repeatedly juxtaposes references to Christ's humanity with references to his divinity, so that the passage has a paradoxical quality. So I typed this passage out um, line by line or phrase by phrase so that you could see the, the balance and the paradox here. Ephesians 7. There is one healer, fleshly and spiritual, born and unborn, in man, God, in death, true life, both from Mary and from God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to explain what St. Ignatius is teaching here in a little bit of depth that I think it's worth going into. Jesus is our one healer. Why do we need a healer? Because our humanity is wounded. Our souls have been wounded by original sin and further damaged by our own personal sins, by the sins of others committed against us, and by the societal evils that have infected our culture. And how does sin wound us? Here's the important point for grasping this. Sin, by definition, is that which is opposed to the way God made things. For example, we human beings are made for truth. God made us with an intellect 
and free will and a conscience. We are made to know the truth, to speak the truth, to do the truth. But when we tell a lie or otherwise act against the truth, we abuse our own humanity. We sin against the way we have been made. We, we damage ourselves further when we sin. We darken our intellect, weaken our will, and render our conscience dull. As a result, the next time we're faced with a moral choice, it will be all the easier to tell a lie, easier to act deceitfully. It will be harder to see the truth clearly, harder to speak up for it and act upon it courageously. By the same token, when we act virtuously, we make the right choice, the next time it's a little bit easier to act virtuously. So we need a healer. Our humanity needs the divine physician. Only our creator, who is divine truth and divine love, can heal us. But how does that divine truth and divine love come to us? How does it reach us and touch us? Through the incarnation. The eternal Son of God became man and lived among us so that he could show us divine mercy in a human way, so that he could teach us God's truth in a way we could understand. Above all, he became man so that he could offer himself to the Father for our sins and at the same time give himself to us as the bread of life. So when our Lord offers himself on the cross, he's offering himself to the Father for our sins, but in the very same act is offering himself to us. Put simply, our one healer must be both true God and true man. This is what Ignatius which wishes to teach us in Ephesians 7. Note, for example, the sixth line, which says, both from Mary and from God. Our Lord Jesus received his human nature from Mary, his divine nature from God. At the center of this passage, the fourth and fifth lines, Ignatius refers to the paradoxical character of our redemption. In man, God. In death, true life. The true God came to us as mortal man. And by his death, he brought us true life, immortal life. Finally, notice the seventh line, first passable, then impassable. Passable means able to suffer. When the Son of God became man in the womb of the Virgin, he joined, him, he joined to himself human nature in a mortal state. Uh, he joined to himself a humanity that could suffer and die. But in his resurrection, his humanity was transformed and glorified. It could never suffer and die again. Why does Ignatius consider this so important? I, I suppose you could say he considers it so important because St. Paul and the author of the letter to the Hebrews and St. John all considered it so important. But uh, as best I can discern, here, here's the reason they all thought this was so significant, that Christ's humanity was glorified. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, 
at the climactic point of the Bread of Life discourse, our Lord solemnly declares, the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. That's John 6, verse 51. But how does he give his flesh for the life of the world? He gives his flesh only once, but he does it in two modalities, two modes, two ways. First, he gives his flesh by dying on the cross. For this to happen, he must be first passable. He must be able to suffer and die. Second, he gives his flesh in the Eucharist as a representation of what happened on the cross. The Eucharist is a sacramental modality of presence, a sacramental way for Christ to be present to us and to give himself to us. For this to happen, however, his humanity must become impassable. That is, it must be glorified in heaven. That is why Ignatius says, first passable, then impassable. With that in mind, let's look at another short passage from the same letter, uh, Ephesians 20. Here, Christology, ecclesiology, and teaching on the Eucharist all converge. Come together in the grace of the name, in one faith and one Jesus Christ who is from the stock of David, according to the flesh, son of man and son of God, so that you may obey the bishop and the body of presbyters with undisturbed understanding, breaking one bread, which is the medicine of immortality, the antidote that enables us not to die but to live forever in Jesus Christ. Notice that Ignatius here takes two Christological titles from the New Testament, Son of Man and Son of God, and combines them in one description of Jesus Christ. To say that Jesus is Son of Man and Son of God is a biblical way of saying that he is true man and true God. Ignatius is the first to do this, to put those two titles together and to do it for that reason. Many of the other church fathers will follow suit and do the same thing. Next, notice that Ignatius describes the central action of the church, the sacred liturgy. When Christians come together, they are united in word and sacrament. They confess the one faith and they break the one bread. Finally, in this passage, notice that Ignatius calls the Eucharist the medicine of immortality. This harkens back to chapter seven in the same letter where Ignatius described Jesus as our one healer. The Eucharist is the medicine by which our healer, the Lord Jesus, heals our wounded humanity. One of the symptoms of our malady is that our desires are disordered. This is a topic for a whole other talk, but I'm going to give you a very brief synopsis of this, this point in order to read one more very important passage from Ignatius that deals with the Eucharist. The world that God has created and all the creatures that fill it are good. Remember Genesis chapter 1, verse 30, God saw that it was good. 
Very good. It is right that we should desire what is good. But when we love creatures more than we love the creator, that is a serious disorder. If I go to Sunday Mass to worship God, but all I can think about is the meal that I will eat afterwards, or the March Madness games I plan to watch, my desires are objectively disordered. God is infinitely more worthy of my love than March Madness. The sacramental life is a kind of lifelong therapy from baptism to the last rites. And a big part of this therapy is to get our desires reordered. We do not accomplish this by trying to suppress desire itself. Now, we do fast and we do abstain and we uh, need spiritual discipline, but it's not simply a question of trying to suppress desire per se, desire itself. That is futile. To attempt it is futile. We are creatures of desire because we are made for love. This is why God has come to us in the humanity of Jesus Christ and why Jesus comes to us as food and drink in the Eucharist. He's the one who made us as creatures of desire and he comes to us in a way which he can attract us to himself and contact us in, in, in our creaturehood. In the Eucharist, we experience the most intimate presence of our Lord Jesus apart from heaven itself. Let us conclude by listening to one more passage from Ignatius from his remarkable letter to the Romans. As he approached martyrdom, Ignatius explained that a great transformation had been taking place within him. He now desired nothing more than to be united with his Eucharistic Lord. So we're going to give Ignatius the last word here. I'm going to just read this great passage from Romans 7 and it'll give you something to think about and pray about. Though alive, I write as one desiring to die. My passion has been crucified, and there is in me no fire of love for material things. But there is in me living and speaking water, saying from within, come to the Father. I take no delight in perishable food or the pleasures of this life. The bread of God is what I want, that is, the flesh of Jesus Christ, who is from the seed of David. And for drink, I want his blood, which is the imperishable love. St. Ignatius of Antioch, pray for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, St. Ignatius, for saving me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Vall. We'll uh, take some time for some questions. If you'd like to come up to the mic, I'll move it more to the center. I'm sorry, it, it will help me. I, I'm hearing impaired. It will help me a lot if you pull the mask down so I can lip read a little. I wonder if St. Ignatius ever knew um, St. Paul.
all, I know it was a different time, but did they ever? Yeah, it, it, it's possible. I mean, it, since he became, uh, the, the question is, did St. Ignatius know St. Paul, possibly? Um, since Ignatius became the bishop of Antioch, it's likely that he grew up in Antioch. And as I said, he was born around the time that St. Paul was undergoing his missionary activity. And for most of that period, Paul's home base was Antioch in Syria. So it's possible that he met him when he was very young. Uh, but Paul died in the 60s when Ignatius probably was still pretty young, pretty young maybe yeah. in his teens, Teen. maybe. Yeah. Thank you. He, he clearly has great reverence for St. Paul, and, and um, we, we would say he was devoted to him. Is there a difference between the agape meal and, and the Eucharist, or are there the same? Well, the, well, the agape the meal was a larger... Um, sort of, I don't know if it's the right term, quasi-liturgical structure or context in which the Eucharist seems to have been offered. So it was a communal meal um, that included the Eucharist. Now, did they have the Eucharist first and then sort of sit down to a communal meal? Uh, you, you would think that would be the right way to do it, but what little evidence we have suggests that it was probably the other way around, that they ate their full meal and then had the Eucharist. And so uh, St. Paul is already complaining about this in 1 Corinthians, that there are people uh, picking out and getting drunk at, at the Eucharist, you know, in the same sort of setting in which the Eucharist was offered. In, in your... Um, New Test well, if you, if you use the RSV, probably other translations, um, the agape meal is translated love feast. It, it only occurs once or twice in the New Testament. It occurs in the epistle of Jude for sure in uh, verse 12 and possibly also in 2 Corinthians. I was worried you were going to ask a question. Here we go. Um, I, I wanted to ask, does, so I see that Ignatius of Antioch makes the connection between the Eucharist and the hierarchical church, the bishops and uh, yeah. presbyters and deacons. But does he really, does he make a, a connection between the Eucharist and kind of the mystical body insofar as, you know, uh, particularly like how we participate in the passion of Christ. I, I guess I'm kind of thinking of, uh, is, I think it's the martyrdom of Polycarp where he becomes like, yeah. the, starts to take on the aroma of bread. And I'm wondering if there's like any connection that Ignatius draws yeah, similarly. Well, well uh, the, the closest thing he says to that passage you allude to in Martyrdom of Polycarp is when he refers to himself as mm -hmm. the wheat of God, yeah. and that in, in a context of talking about his martyrdom coming up, you know, his impending martyrdom. Um, I think, though, the, 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 the sort of key ecclesiological passage is the one where he uses the term Catholic Church because he's drawing a direct parallel between the, the, the multitude, which is sort of a technical term in early Christianity for the local church, mm -hmm. The local church gathered, certainly for Eucharist, under its bishop. Mm -hmm. He draws a parallel between that and Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, which mm -hmm. would be the whole mystical body. Mm -hmm. And there's a parallel there between the bishop and Christ. Yeah. The, the bishop is acting in the, you know, um, in the place of Christ, so to speak, at the level of the local church. So I think there's a lot implied there about what's happening in the um, Eucharistic celebration at the level of the local church and what's, you know, at the very same time happening in terms of the, the whole church, the Catholic church. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Can I maybe ask one more? Sure. <laughs> okay. um, Thought I had escaped. I yeah. um, also wanted to ask, I remember you had mentioned this before in class, that one of the things that Ignatius is criticized for is uh, a lack of Old Testament references. And, but you brought the standard of the cross 
uh, as a reference to Jesse's, yes. uh, the rod of Jesse. Right. Right. So I was wondering, um, too, does he, because it seems like he has a lot of connections with the uh, wisdom tradition yep. as well. So I was just wondering if you could yeah. comment on that. Right. So he, um, he does quote directly from the Old Testament three times. Mm -hmm. Two of those are from Proverbs, wisdom mm -hmm. tradition, uh, wisdom literature. I think the other is from uh, Isaiah. And, but um, he also alludes to, sort of makes verbal echoes of any number of Old Testament passages, including Psalm 1. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think that's where modern scholars have kind of underappreciated his knowledge of the Old Testament. They're not picking up on uh, many of his Old Testament echoes. They're perhaps a little subtle for them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why you some occasionally need an Old Testament scholar to read Ignatius's you know, letters so you can pick up yeah. on those. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I have one more question. Sure. Do you have any recommended readings uh, any books that uh, I'd like to read more about? Yeah, there, there are a lot of um, good books. I, you know, first of all, obviously, if you've never read the letters themselves, uh, you want to do that. There's an older book, uh, gosh, I think it's called Early Christian Writers. It's by C.C. Richardson, and he gives a translation of Ignatius's letters and a bunch of other early Christian documents like the Didache. Um, and he has, you know, short but significant introductions to Ignatius's letters that are, I think, helpful. That might be a place to start. Um, boy. It's probably limited information. Yeah. I don't there's a, um, there's a, a commentary by Kenneth Howell on Ignatius's letters, and I think also on, I think also on First Clement, and that's uh, that's pretty readable, a lot more readable than my book, <laughs> <laughs> also a lot less expensive than my book. So, but um, yeah, that's not bad. Kenneth Howell. Those yeah, are the first two two things come to my mind. Okay, great. Thank you. I was going to say that you didn't plug your own book, said a lot about you, but then you kind it, of did a little bit. Yeah, if it wasn't yeah. so obscenely expensive, I, <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't hesitate to do that. Amalia, on our YouTube chat, would like to ask, is the abuse at the agape meal the reason that we are asked to fast before receiving the Eucharist? I, I, indirectly, it may well be. I don't know that for a fact, you know, historically, how that developed, but um, it does seem to be kind of, uh, you know, forestalling that, that sort of problem, that it, it, in, in a way sort of setting aside the Eucharistic liturgy, that time of the week, and, and, and sort of setting it aside for God's purposes and keeping a little distance between that and, you know, mere non-sacramental eating of meals. So that, that makes good sense but, I don't, sense, but I don't know that for a fact. One more question? If you don't mind, I actually have two, if that's okay. Oh, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah, if you don't um, mind pulling your mask down. Yeah, so yeah no, I'm sorry. Good. Um, I guess as a lay person, as myself in the church, I just want to know how does someone like me become more like St. Ignatius in the sense of being more devout and be more in love with the Eucharist? I mean, I, I truly am, but just just the passion that I feel like he has for it and just any tips and advice you can give yeah. just to fall fully, deeply in yeah. love with that. Well, I mean, reading his letters prayerfully, um, I, I, you know, I think they, they are tremendously profound. You put the, the, the seven letters together are about the length of Mark's gospel, so they're not terribly long, but he has a kind of aphoristic way of speaking, you know, a lot of little one-liners, but they're really loaded. 
So one of my favorites is um, from, from Trallians 5, we lack many things in order that we may not lack God. That, that's how, that one line has helped me so often as I kind of have to come to terms with all of my own deficiencies in life and in, in my character and so forth um, to, to realize that it's, it's drawing me toward God. And and uh, that that's that that itself is a good thing. Yes, sir. So he's he's very profound. Yes, sir. And then the second one, um, I know you were hit on uh, the when he became passable, um, and he became you know true flesh, true flesh and true man, and then the impassable is when he was raised to heaven. But you said he, when he died, obviously when you died from sin, I know you know God Himself and Jesus Himself never had sin, nor did right. Mary. But when you're saying he died from sin, was he dying from our sins? Is that yes. Sins he um, yeah. It, the, I, I didn't say it. St. Paul said it. Oh, yeah. Um, St. <laughs> Paul says the death he died, he died to sin, um, and meaning that our Lord actively resisted the power of sin. St. Peter explains this in his uh, first epistle, chapter two. And he says, you know, Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Uh, so he doesn't respond in kind to sin. Uh, in fact, he allows it to crush him. But paradoxically, that is how he dies to sin. He, he's, not going to, he's not going to participate in the dynamics of sin that mar our ways of relating to each other and our societal life so often. He's going to actively resist it. So yes, in a sense, he is dying to our sin, but it's still an act on his part. Doesn't mean that he sinned ever, yeah. but, but it's, it's, a, it's a way of dying that actually accomplishes our salvation. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Can everyone please join me in thanking Dr. Vall one more time? That was a truly excellent lecture. You can see why Dr. Vall is so beloved here at the seminary. He's a real gift. Um, so moving forward, our next presentation will be on Wednesday, April 21st with Dr. David Liberto, who's a dogmatic theologian here at the seminary. He'll be talking about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And then some guy named Jordan Haddad will be talking in May about Eucharistic images and art. And then Father Michael Champon of the Community of Jesus Crucified, with Brother John Joseph and the others right there, will be speaking in June about the Eucharist and human suffering, which will just be tremendous. So we hope that you can join us for our upcoming uh, presentations and lectures. Hope you have a safe evening this evening and a good St. Patrick's Day, and thank you for, for coming.